Technology has made it easier to conduct our business behind avatars, screen names, and secondary email addresses. Of course, this online activity generates information that could be linked back to us. Sites like Amazon and Netflix keep a record of which pages you viewed in order to help recommend things to you in the future, uh, or maybe to sell your, uh, your contact information to uh, purveyors of targeted advertising. But we go to these pages with the expectation that this is all done by machines, by algorithms, and that there isn't really a human being there tracking our activities. Um, and here's what Google explains about this. It's important to note that our scanning and indexing procedures are 100% automated and involve no human interaction. Now, having a machine know your habits and using the information to provide you with products somehow seems a lot less intrusive than having some employee at Google reading your emails and tracking information and then deciding that, uh, uh, oh, you need a local divorce lawyer and maybe a, a subscription to the advocate. Uh, <laughs> now, the public, the public has fiercely protested similar violations of anonymity. Uh, take, a uh, take, a uh, uh, take a response to the way Facebook has pushed the envelope from time to time. In 2007, the site launched an online system called Beacon that tracked user activity on particular sites, such as NewYorkTimes.com and Fandango.com. Uh, comment on a story or buy a movie ticket on, uh, uh, and Facebook would instantly send the information to your friends and relatives or your various contacts. Um, now, it still seems like a good idea, uh, but people found that it wasn't such a great feature when they started uh, shopping for Christmas. People started uh, suddenly saying, oh my God, why is my best friend wearing those uh, diamond earrings that my boyfriend bought online? Created all sorts of problems. <laughs> Uh, face tens of thousands of people protesting in class, uh, and uh, the prospects of a class action lawsuit, Facebook eventually scrapped Beacon. Uh, just last year, Facebook caused an uproar when it switched many items on users' profiles from private to public. Facebook again had to cut back on what information it made public and to simplify its controls. It turns out there are more than two million people that have joined a Facebook group called Millions Against Facebook's Privacy Policies and Layout Design. So you have to join Facebook to be able to join this group. Um, in a recent survey conducted by researchers at Berkeley and Penn, about 90% of the under 35 crowd agreed that there should be a law requiring websites and advertising companies to delete all stored information about them. A majority of the sample reported being more concerned about privacy issues than they were five years ago. So what can we conclude from all of this? I think it's fair to say that privacy is not dead as an ideal. People still crave it and expect it, despite the inroads made by technology. In many ways, people expect more privacy as a result of technology and feel resentful and angry when they learn that technology has betrayed them. At the same time, it's clear that people are willing to trade quite a bit of privacy for a little bit of convenience. No one here, suspect, I suspect, is going to stop carrying a cell phone, or even that second cell phone, even though we fully, we are fully aware it's tracing our location just about every moment of the day. Now, the government is perfectly happy to take advantage of our devil's bargain by dipping into available stores of information about us, and it will also create databases of its own to keep track of our movements and habits in an effort to solve past crimes and deter future crimes. Indeed, immediately after 9-11, much blame was laid on the FBI and other law enforcement agencies for failure to uncover the criminal conspiracy before it had a chance to achieve its nefarious goals. One might say that Americans are a bit schizophrenic or maybe hypocritical on this regard. We resent it bitterly when the government snoops around in our lives, but we're highly critical when it fails to detect criminal activity by monitoring would-be criminals and terrorists. But how is the government going to figure out who the terrorists are unless it studies the habits of a lot of ordinary people so it can spot their unusual behavior? In a very real sense, the government can't watch out for terrorists among us unless it keeps an eye on all of us. 
And this brings us to the Fourth Amendment, which provides that people shall be secure in their homes, papers, and effects. As originally conceived and interpreted for most of our history, this was a protection against invasion of property. If the government wanted to enter our homes or read our papers or examine our things, it had to comply with the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. This all worked pretty well so long as life unfolded in, a in the concrete spaces of the physical world. After all, you couldn't read my diary or business records without entering the building where they were stored and you, without actually physically getting a hold of them, uh, of the notebook or the ledger and, and, and doing, you know, and reading what, what's in there. Now this all changed with the advent of the telephone. In 1928, the Supreme Court got a case involving the criminal prosecution based on evidence obtained by tapping defendant's phone line. Officials, uh, police never entered his home or office. Instead, they climbed the telephone pole in front of the house and just uh, tapped the lines. The so Supreme Court made short work of the case. The police didn't commit a trespass on the defendant's property and thus did not invade any interest protected by the Fourth Amendment. Now, th this didn't sit well with Justice Brandeis, who almost 40 years earlier had co-authored a highly influential article in the Harvard Law Review entitled The Right to Privacy. It continues to be one of the most frequently cited law review articles of all time. Now, just as um, Brandeis dissented in Olmstead, the wiretapping case, he argued that the police had violated defendant's right to privacy by listening to his private phone conversation. In effect, Brandeis was urging the Supreme Court to jettison static concepts of property rights as a benchmark for the Fourth Amendment. Instead, he argued the Fourth Amendment protects the right to be left alone. Under his view, the Fourth Amendment didn't stop at the front door of our houses or businesses, nor was it limited to gaining physical access to the content of communications. Rather, Brandeis argued the Fourth Amendment protected an intangible concept of personal autonomy that defends us against much more than physical invasion of our property rights. If Justice Brandeis' 1928 dissent has a surprisingly modern ring to it, it's because the idea he planted took root and eventually became the Fourth Amendment as we know it today. In 1967, the Supreme Court decided Katz versus the United States, which involved uh, the police taping of a phone conversation. Katz was uh, uh, in a phone booth uh, making illegal bets, and the police were on to him. So they placed a tape recorder on the outside of the booth and managed to record Katz's half of the telephone call. The government argued that it had fully complied with Olmstead, so the taping was just fine. But in a world of ubiquitous telephones, teletypes, telegraphs, tiny microphones, and tape recorders, ju justices were no longer willing to limit the Fourth Amendment to invasions of property rights. Instead, the court held that the police violated Katz's Fourth Amendment rights because he had a reasonable expectation of privacy when he closed the door of the phone booth. Katz overruled Olmsted and discarded the property-based foundation on which it rested. In its place came a new standard. The Fourth Amendment protects an individual reasonable expectation of privacy. The, pre, uh, the uh, protection extends to whatever places and communication an individual can reasonably expect to keep private. Now, this uh, standard has three important features, one good, one sec uh, second so-so, and the third pretty bad. The first is that the standard comports much more with the modern way of life. In a world where people communicate electronically, travel, uh, travel extensively by public transport, and stay in places that are not their own homes, the new standards uh, better reflect the values of the Fourth Amendment. The not so good feature is that the boundaries of the new standard aren't as well defined uh, as uh, property rights. It's often hard to know in advance whether a particular invasion of privacy is also a constitutional violation. This leaves both the government and the public uncertain about their respective rights. They have to, they have to wait for the courts to tell them afterwards whether someone's rights were violated. And the issue often arises after the police have seized highly incriminating evidence, so the finding constitutional violation very likely means a guilty guy will walk. 
So the incentive is to find that the police didn't conduct an illegal search. At least that's the way, sort of the pull. Now, the worst aspect of the new regime, however, is tied up with the word reasonable. The courts will not protect an individual's expectation of privacy if it's not reasonable. And how do you determine whether something is reasonable? The test is whether we, as a society, recognize the privacy interests as one worthy of protection. And when it comes to privacy, what you and others in society think and do has a profound effect on my rights. The fact that I consider certain conduct to be private is of little consequence if most people act like it's not. The scope of my right to privacy thus depends on common expectations which are shaped by the actions and attitudes of everyone else. Now let's say cats were decided today. What would the Supreme Court say? Judges and justices live in the world and understand how it works. Today there are no public spaces set aside for having phone conversations, so people converse on the phone just about anywhere, anytime, and usually in an extra loud tone of voice. <laughs> at the airport, at the grocery store, in the doctor's office, in restaurants, and even in movie theaters. Um, would the court really say that a guy standing on a street corner shouting into his cell phone had a reasonable expectation of privacy? You know, I suspect not. Uh, they would say that people in general didn't value privacy very much when it came to phone conversation, and therefore phone communications aren't private. Now, I'm not too worried that the Supreme Court will overrule cats. I think um, uh, once it held that phone communications are private, I think it'll stick with it for a good long time. But we've come a long ways from cats, and most of our communications these days uh, aren't uh, just by phone. Uh, they are by email, by text message, by Facebook post, by tweet, by Gchat, uh, and Skype, and who knows what's next. We no longer keep diaries locked away uh, with a key and hidden under a floorboard in our homes. We keep them on a server somewhere in the cloud, or on a laptop, or on an iPhone. The world is changing very rapidly, and what is a re reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to newer kinds of te technology is still very much in flux. And it is there that privacy seems to be least respected as a value. Many modern pr practices seem to suggest that people are not interested in privacy. People blog about their sexual exploits. They post immodest pictures of themselves on social media sites. They appear on shows like Jerry Springer and air their dirty laundry. They discuss intimate subjects within full hearing of a room full of people. They, comp uh, they promiscuously disclose their activities on emails and tweets. Of course, not everybody may be doing this. In fact, my suspicion is that it's really a minority, perhaps a small minority. But they set the bar for the rest of us because they have a disproportionate impact on our perception of what is reasonable uh, in expecting privacy. To understand why, imagine that out of a group of 100 people, 90 guard their privacy jealously, while 10 are fairly exhibitionistic. You would know right away that there were 10 who didn't care about their privacy because you'd hear them shouting out in airports and uh, posting uh, blogs and so on. But you'd know a lot less about the ni other 90. Unless you knew there were 90 a priori, you would have no way of knowing what their practices were of how m or how many there were. So the 10 visible ones would exert a disproportionate influence on our perception of people's preferences. And what we think, and what we think is a prevailing view defines a zone of privacy we can reasonably expect for our purposes um, uh, 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 under the Fourth Amendment. Remember that we are all tied together at the ankle so that your view of what you wish to preserve more, uh, that you wish to preserve more privacy than the society at large will make little difference because idiosyncratic views are perforce not considered reasonable. 